Okay. Yes, we are recording. Okay, so I'm here with Turi Drugos, and I wanted to talk to her personally about her books, her work, her 50 years of work working as a dog trainer, because you celebrated 50 years working as a dog trainer last year, Turi. I did. Yeah. Congratulations. 50. Thank you. So I have a lot of questions about your books and, and everything. Let me just start with the beginning. What did you do before you started working with dogs? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was um, observing animals. And that has been my uh, more or less uh, a lifetime project. I started when I was two years old, and I've been going on since then, observing, observing, observing. And uh, I know today, at that time, it was just something I had to do. Mm -hmm. I, that was what I wanted to do. That was my life uh, to observe. Uh, today, I know that that is probably the best you can ever do. Sit down, shut up, don't think about training and doing and running and all kind of things. Sit down and observe. That's the only way you can learn to listen to another animal. Just like people cannot listen to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't hear what people say. You have to sit still and open your ears. And when it comes to animals, it will be the eyes. You have to look. But you you didn't reflect on that when you were a young child. So you just no. enjoyed I just did it. animals, did you? you? I'm not sure if I enjoyed it. I just had to do it. Yeah. That was uh, some kind of magnetic uh, thing. Uh, when there was an animal around, I had to observe it. And that, that was just how it was. So, so I'm born a little bit strange. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so when did you get your first dog, your very first dog? Did your parents have a dog or did you get your no, dog? Or? My parents uh, didn't have a, a dog, but uh, they gave up on me <laughs> when I was 10 years old and brought me a five-year-old uh, rehomed dog to take care of. And, you know, I never forgiven them that. I mean, the dog and I, we got the best friends ever. We were like this. Mm -hmm. But a kid should never, never take care of a dog. No, no matter how good a kid is with animals, it is not fair. Mm -hmm. Because our brains at that age uh, will not be developed enough to be able to take care of anybody else. That's nature. We have to grow up first and be adult before we can do that. So uh, I had her for uh, just a few years and then my uh, parents got uh, tired of her and and uh, put her down without even telling me about it. Oh. And, that, and that's uh, a sorrow that I have uh, lived with all my life. Mm -hmm. So you, you were a bit older when you got your next dog? When you Did you decide that yourself or? Yeah, uh, I knew I would have a dog, but I couldn't have one as long as I didn't have any stable living. I need to have a stable life, knowing where I was going to be and so on. So I waited till I was, uh, I was married and we settled down in a place where my husband were going, was going to work. And uh, my child was old enough because they had to be old enough to take instruction. So when she was six years old, I had been saving money for a puppy and I got it. What kind of dog was that? That was a Scottish Collie. Mm -hmm. And I had, it was so little literature at that time. It was almost nothing. But I, I read about all the things I could come across and uh, w went to dog shows just to see what they looked like. 
and I felt connected with the Collie. Mm -hmm. And that was a good choice. The Scottish Collies have always since been my dog in a way. If there's a Collie around, they always find me. Because you told me that you've been doing you've been doing everything that has to do with dogs. Yeah. There is a misconception out there that to doesn't know anything about dog sports, but I don't know where even to begin. <laughs> so you know, I think I know more about dog sports than many other people because I've tried it all. But the difference is that I have seen the consequences. And I dropped what I saw was not good for the dog, what the dog didn't want to do, and was nothing we would have any good results of. So, uh, and results I mean physically, mentally, and not prize winning things, because that has never been anything I've been interested in. But I've tried it all and have been very successful. My first collie was one of the best uh, uh, obedience dogs in Norway for a long, long time. I mean, there are still, I still meet people who remember her because she was such a fabulous dog in the, in the show ring. She was very, very special and she loved it. That's why I went, kept going on with it. She, uh, she actually won a price as late as when she was 13. I didn't want to take her to a competition at that age. I told the others, I can't. I mean, she's too old. She cannot do that. She cannot do the jump. And I said, but we need one dog. We are a team and we need one dog more. Please come. And we actually won the prize as a team with a 13 year old dog on on the on the team and this was obedience or yes yeah yes that was uh, that was uh, elite uh, obedience and uh, agility you've been doing agility as well yeah i was uh, you know it was a new thing it turned up as um just uh, something to show at uh, the crafts i can't remember exactly late 80s or something mm -hmm. and uh, it looked fun so I looked into it and I was actually among the, the first group of uh, judges or agility here in Norway. So I was a judge for a couple of years in agility. And uh, then I realized I was the worst judge ever. I've never been good at judging. I get too, I get too observant. Yeah. I observe the dog instead <laughs> of judging. I just had to give it up. <laughs> So I, I love to hear the, your side of, of the, the story about obedience training and yeah, mm. the kind of training because has obedience training changed a lot from the past 50 years? And if so, why and how and why do we want still to do the same kind of training that we did 50 years ago? What do you think? Some things are the same, but in a different way. To talk a little bit foggy, <laughs> but um, a lot of things have changed uh, dramatically because uh, when we uh, when we did obedience in the seventies and eighties, we actually had a little fun. Mm. Uh, the the absolutely first obedience competition I went to, my dog just took off and went out of the ring and had a fight with another dog, and it, it, it was not a big thing. Uh, today everything is so darn bloody serious, and everything should be perfect, and it should uh, look like this and be like this. We were a little bit more on the what shall we say, hobby side in a way. And the big change came uh, in the 1980s, early 1980s, because in 1974, a book was published in the US uh, about uh, training of uh, German shepherds. And for some reason, that book started to be the example for for trainers everywhere. Mm 
And they started with something totally new. They started this scruff shaking. We had never done that before. Nobody did that to dogs. That was cruel. But then we started. No, not me, but people started. And uh, also to let them lie down and lie still. And they should, they should be under command, total command. And they should look up at, into your eyes. Mm -hmm. They went healing. You know, they did stuff like that. Uh, the people who introduced this, they regretted it since because they saw uh, uh, the results of it. Mm -hmm. But that was too late because people had uh, adopted it all over the world and they still do it. I think scruff shaking is uh, more or less gone. It's not so much of it now. I never see it in our country. Uh, and uh, a few other things as well. But this uh, total command and going at the side and looking into your eyes and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. And it started, it came to Norway around 1980, early 80s, and it started to be popular. And so we had all these years where it's not fun to go looking at obedience competitions anymore. When I did, and my dog actually won a lot of prizes. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was so extremely good in the obedience ring. She's one of the very few dogs who ever got 220 points out of 220 possible and i don't think there are many dogs who got that ever but she never went looking up into my eyes she followed and did what she did and she liked it she had fun with it and that i think that's the difference you don't see dogs having any fun with it anything anymore and they get physically damaged because of this looking up. If you stand behind them and see them walk, they are totally out of balance. The whole body is twisted and their neck is twisted. They must have so much muscle pain that I cannot even imagine. So it actually started off being a nicer thing to do and then it got more strict or more yeah. yeah, well, if you go even further back, just after the Second World War, it was bad because they, the people, the only people who did any training then, they had adopted the, the German military methods and they were horrible with dog whips and screaming and yelling and all that sort of thing. Uh, but that faded away. So when we started to get ordinary uh, clubs around the country, which started in the late uh, 1940s and 50s. Here almost all clubs, yeah. almost all clubs started then. Then we got more hobby things. People who wanted to do things together with their dogs and so on. And that's when we got these more mellow ways, more relaxed ways. Yeah. yeah. But now we're back to the more I think, I think it's worse now because uh, everybody does it and everybody has got the idea they have to go to classes and all classes do things like that and they use all kind of threatening things to dogs and i i saw this very early coming so when i started my own dog training school in 1984 I actually, all the, uh, the, the clients coming to me, all the people who came to my, I had some classes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked them what they, I want, I asked them two things, what they wanted to learn. And there was no people ever during all those years I ran it who asked for any of the obedience exercises. Mm. They asked for things th that were good for them in daily life. Walking on a loose leash was top. That was number one. Being alone at home was a good number two and things like that. Mm. Nobody wanted an obedient dog. And then the second thing I asked them about was when they came as clients, when did the problem start? 
And the scary thing was that absolutely 100 percentage of all the answers I got said during or straight after the class they had been going to. Wow. And that says something about the classes. Some of them are not bad. Yeah. But uh, it still was too much for the dog. And the dogs didn't learn much and the people didn't learn much. Everybody got stressed and they got problems. Mm -hmm. So I started quite early to realize that classes is not the best way. Maybe you can go to some classes when the dog is adult, is uh, well balanced mentally and physically and can handle things like that. But you don't go to a class with a puppy or a dog that is not experienced yet. You have to do it a different way. So private lessons. Private lessons. Uh, I did have some puppy groups, but I had a private lesson with them first. Put them together in small groups. Mm -hmm. The biggest group I ever had was seven puppies and that was just accidentally. And they were all very good friends because they came little by little. Uh, but three, four is the best. Because it's too much for them. Yep. They cannot handle it. They don't learn anything. So uh, things have changed. And I'm very sad to see that a lot of the classes I see being run around today they are just like they were in the 1980s and even much longer back. Some of them are really cruel. And, and they start even new cruel things that is so bad for dogs. Where do they, do they get all these nasty ideas from? Uh, today I read in the paper here that uh, with big, big headlines and everything, about a weight pulling competition here in town and with a big picture of a little chihuahua who was so good at pulling heavy weights yeah you know they get totally physically damaged by it just think about the the shoulders of dogs the shoulders who are not attached to the body with anything but muscles they and uh, then they must be damaged there's no way out of it. And this is, is this a new thing? This, yeah, way this is a new thing. Yeah. yeah. That didn't exist before. Okay. So, um, dog trainers or people working with dogs are not very good at, um, think or doing, they're not very in, uh, how do you say that in English? Um, well, to do things in, in new ways. Mm. to change things change is going slow or is since we're doing the the puppy classes the same way as we did 30 40 years ago mm. it's time to do something different isn't it yeah i i tried uh, i've tried to talk to people about how they can do it you have also been a part of it this testing of dogs the testing of dogs you just start with that and how do you test the dog you observe and that's all you do you sit down shut up do nothing and observe and by observing you can see all the things the dog is actually telling you or trying to tell you and it shouldn't be that difficult and this is a good chance to ask you. So how did you come about writing the book, the first book? Because that is your first book. We're going to talk about your other books a little bit later mm. on talking terms with dogs, which was published the first time in uh, English, in English. In no, I, I'm not sure if it was 1995 or 96. I'm not sure about it, but um, it wasn't sold a lot then just a little. Uh, and uh, later it was uh, published uh, by someone who was better at um, marketing it. And that's when it uh, started to be popular. 
Okay, so many questions. So why mm-hmm. did you, you, you sat down with a colleague of yours? And well, <laughs> the story is like I, you know, at that time there was very little you could learn from. There were not many knowledgeable people you felt like you could learn anything from. Uh, and finally, when um, a veterinary Obren in Oslo, he put up an instructor course and he was very knowledgeable. He had some knowledge about things that nobody else had, about stress and things. He had been traveling to the US and other places and were quite. Uh, he had quite a lot of, uh, of knowledge about things. And that was the course that uh, put things together for me. Um, it went on for one and a half year and we had uh, we learned a few things and during one of the lectures we were told because they also used there were so few books that they used old books still uh, so in 1990 they still used conrad lawrence books from 1930s no that was that was the big thing yeah uh, and of course uh, that says something about uh, behavior level yeah. we were at. And in these old books, Conrad Lawrence and a couple of others, and it says that, uh, oh, they have observed that wolves have aggression calming signals so they can avoid getting into conflict with each other. But dogs didn't have it. Okay. And that raised a red cloth in front of my face because on my observations through a lifetime already, I knew they had them. I had seen that. So I raised my hand and protested against it. And I was told to shut up because Conrad Lawrence knew more than I did. And I felt really pissed off to be quite honest but there was another pupil there who had the same feeling and that was uh, my colleague Stolle and he talked to me afterwards Tudin should we start to do a study about this yes let's do that and we started a study because because we wanted to prove that dogs actually do have calming signals mm. not only aggression calming signals but calming signals we had seen it both of us i had seen a lot of it so i was sure but we had to prove it and we started this uh, study that went on for two years filming picturing observing 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 hundreds of those you have no idea how much work we put into this. And we were totally consumed with it. Uh, Stoller had to give up because his wife uh, got uh, fed up with all this uh, <laughs> study. <laughs> and then he had to give up. So uh, we had to finish it. And we finished it off by putting together a talk with the slides as we had at that time the dias yeah <laughs> and uh, it tried to uh, to to have this talk to some uh, local dog clubs which nearly laughed their heads off it was so what, what a comical thing to talk about and nothing happened then at the end of this uh, instructor course uh, veterinary Oberon, a brilliant brilliant type he um, told us about uh, the human animal bond conference that was going on in montreal in canada when what year was this approximately I'm not sure it was 1990 or 1991 because I'm totally horrible with, uh, with numbers, but it was at the end of the course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he invited all the students to, to take a trip together over there. Mm-hmm. 
it was a group of us, I can't remember how many, but we were a, a decent group of 8, 10, 12, something like that, that uh, went to Canada to participate in this, uh, this conference. It was my first time to America, and I didn't have any money, so I borrowed money. Nothing could stop me from taking part in that. I knew I had to. Yeah. So we came to Montreal and uh, it was a lot of things going on, talks, uh, videos showing and this and that. And that was the start of the conference and then it went on like that the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm. Lots of interesting people starting to talk, interesting, making me curious and then finished. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then I went to a talk with uh, a professor from England and he had as a co-speaker uh, with him Terry Ryan. She was sitting beside him and she couldn't say much because he talked all the time and that's <laughs> what he usually does. So. And he told about um, his, uh, his students in England at the university. Uh, he uh, sent them out to observe dogs, and I got interested. Ooh, somebody's observing. Okay, so um, they observed groups of dogs. Uh, it would be, for instance, five, uh, five dogs. I think it was. I'm not sure if it was, uh, was Camelin Kinshasa or something. Mm -hmm. There were some small dogs, anyway. Five of them, and they were going to observe them for one hour. And then they came back and reported what they had seen. And they could all tell that dogs like that with round faces and hanging ears, they had no language. Can you imagine uh, Mrs. Rugo's uh, <laughs> yes. uh, more or less exploding? Yeah. yeah. Hello, <laughs> Professor. I have something to say <laughs> and told him what I thought about it. Uh, my uh, vet, uh, veterinary overend was sitting further back. He was so embarrassed of me that he was almost <laughs> creeping under the seat. <laughs> but um, at that point, I was non-stop. I mean, you cannot say that. And I, and I asked him, what did you tell them to observe? Mm -hmm. And then he said the typical, well, they had to find out what they're going to see. And, uh, you know, everybody knows that if you don't know what to look for, you don't see it. So they didn't see anything because they didn't know what they were looking for. Yeah. So that was it. I went out of the room and there were a lot of the people there almost throw themselves on me and wanted to know, where do you know this from? Where have you learned this? Uh, where can we hear about it? Where can we read about it? Mm. So there were and, other interested people that were, yeah. Yes, they they got my my message. The professor was steaming mad, and he has hated me ever since. <laughs> I met him a few times, <laughs> but people were interested. And when I went out of the room and down the uh, the, the hallway, uh, Terry Ryan was following me, and she had hunted me and uh, asked me, started to ask me about it and got really interested. And she said, you have to tell about this. Yeah. You have to uh, you have to write a book. And I said, no, I can't write a book about this. That's impossible, I never, never thought about it. Uh, we talked a bit more and I signed up for her camp the year uh, after. And I was actually there at her camps every summer for three or four years, I think. Okay, yeah. And she came to me to Norway. It didn't actually get much out of that. I was thinking about writing uh, a book, but uh, I thought it was hopeless. But then I got, um, I got a dog that uh, needed me to sit still for hours and I'm not very good at that. <laughs> so I was sitting there fiddling and fiddling and fiddling and then I wrote a book. 
and uh, it was um, uh, some uh, that worked together with Harry Ryan who actually published it first and it was uh, done in a quite amateurish way so it didn't get out so very far sold a bit of it but not so much but when it was published and marketed properly it started to be very very popular and by now it's been on the top 10 list in america for nearly 20 years i think and now it's uh, translated into do you know how many languages at all I, i've given up finding it out um but it's in uh, all all the most uh, what, should, what should we say common languages yeah. French, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, and Japanese, and yeah, Russian, and all kind. I will, I got a list from you, from the ones you remember, the publishers, mm -hmm. so I will publish uh, on our Facebook page, mm -hmm. and the web page as well, that list, so mm -hmm. you, can, you can try and find it in your own language. Mm -hmm. That was just, now people, the dog owners, wanted to be interested. But how about dog trainers and people working professionally with dogs? Were they interested in what you... Yes, they are in a way. And actually, a lot of them say that they use my book at their classes. But they still haven't learned what calming signals are. I, I get, get across people all the time who tell me, oh, they love calming signals and it's so wonderful and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know what it is. Mm. They haven't got the, uh, the essence of it. It's a part of the dog's language. That's how they speak. It's not to be nice and sweet and cute or anything. It's the way they talk with each other and with us. It's polite. Uh, the dogs are very polite if they are allowed to be. And they will use it to have a nice conversation with you. And that's what they don't get. Because a lot of people um, are getting worried when their dogs are using their calming signals. I mean, would you be worried if I, I said to you, hello, Lisbeth, are you okay today? <laughs> then you would be really scared, wouldn't you? A bit, a bit yes. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, the aim is not to have the dog not use the calming signals. The calming no. signals is a part of communicating. It's part of being. That's what they do all the time. Yeah, I mean... I get uh, people coming to me in my house here, having a dog with them. And of course, when they are in another person's house, they are very polite. So for instance, when they come up to me, they give me a little uh, signal like licking or blinking or turning their head to the side a little bit just to say that, hello there, I'm very friendly. Uh, I, do you want to talk with me? And of course, I answer and I, I just do not stare at them. I don't touch them on the head or things like that. I just say, hello, nice to see you. And you have to understand what they are actually doing. It's a nice way of conversation that you should take part in. And I love dogs to use calming signals and, and they use the small ones very often, all the time, because they want to be polite and nice. But it's also a good indication on how the dog feels. So when we know the coming signs, then mm -hmm. we can, um, we, we know more about how the dog feels. If it doesn't like to feel, to be touched in certain places or be talked to in certain yes. ways and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. They give you a signal about that, and they do it in a very nice, polite way. Please don't do that. I don't like it. And okay, you must respect that. Mm -hmm. Of course you should. And, and another thing is that uh, people say, my dog doesn't know calming signals because he's 
he's acting up and re reactive and barking and lunging and everything. That is later in the uh, development in the situation because the politeness, how we are talking to each other, being nice to each other. If somebody came running into your kitchen with an axe, yeah. trying to hit you, you wouldn't be polite anymore. <laughs> of course not. Then you have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And you don't sit starting there, oh, please, the, you know, this is such a nice day. Hello there. You don't say that. So, and, and that's a big difference. They are polite when they have the chance of being. If the situation is getting scary, threatening, they have to go into defense mood and then politeness is out. Yeah, of course. So the the term calming signals is from the ter term uh, aggression. aggression. Calming signals, yeah. yeah. That was used for wolves. And just once and for all, Turid, some people claim that some breeds do not have calming signals or they have less calming signals. Um, can you just once and for all clear up <laughs> what's going on? I have spent a lifetime, I would say 81 years by now, observing animals. All dogs have it. I have been training, working with all the breeds that is on earth at all. I don't think there's any breed I never had my hands on. They all have them. There's no difference. It can look a little bit different because of their physical outlook. They maybe have to show it a little differently. And I have a, a dog coming here sometimes. He has a lot of fur in the in the face. So he is using more tongue mm -hmm. and more obvious body language because it doesn't really reach anything with his face. So that's the only difference. They all have it. And not only dogs, all mammals have them. Mm -hmm. All mammals have them and we know a lot about cats having it they do the same thing they walk slowly not to make anybody else uh, react to them they look away they stretch they do all these things horses have them and my friend rachel dreisma has written a whole book about the calming signals of horses yeah all mammals have them. We just need to see it. Once, yeah. Once I was called to uh, when I was in the U.S., she she was uh, breeding all kind of uh, parrots, and she said she had a very difficult and aggressive parrot. Mm -hmm. So could I look at it? I said I have no idea about birds. <laughs> I I don't have a bird. I have no idea about birds. But okay. I can observe your bird, but I can observe. And I went there and I did what I would usually do to a dog who was standing in a kennel. I would use all the calming signals I could think of to make him feel good. Mm -hmm. It's the same to the bird. And you know, the bird understood. Yeah. And they're so, born with them, aren't they? Yes, I'm born with them. Because these are typical questions I get as well. That yeah. do they teach them the signals. No, no, they people think they can teach dogs everything. The fact is that dogs know everything from before. And if you want to teach them something that is totally unnatural to them, you should think twice. Why the heck do I do that if it's not nice? I can teach dogs anything. I know everything about teaching. But uh, I wouldn't if the dog wouldn't like to do it or if it's not natural. Which is perfect for my ne next question. What is What do you think is the most important things to teach a puppy or a dog? 
if you need to train them to do something? <laughs> a puppy shouldn't be trained to anything else but learning a few good habits like our kids do. Mm -hmm. Just think about what you do with kids up to five or six years old. What do they learn? They don't learn much. They should probably learn to to eat quite nicely at the table. They shouldn't scream and yell in the face of uh, people or what ordinary things like that. And we teach teach them some good habits that we can have a good family life. And that's what we do with dogs as well. Yeah. So teaching them or helping them understand what uh, be good be good behavior is with people. Yeah, and that means you have to show them yourself. Yeah. Because you are the parent role. And I mean, all kids and all puppies and all young animals, they look at the adults to learn how they are going to be when they grow up. Yeah. And if you are not good, the, your dog won't be either. You you are the role model. And you should also use adult dogs as role models. They are better than you are. And when talking about training and, and things like that, now we talk, we started talking about obedience. It's not good. It's, it's, it's not done in a very nice way. Um, agility and so on can, uh, yeah. Not all agility. Are you against all kinds of training? No, no, no. I mean, everything can be okay. Absolutely everything can be okay. If you are sure that it's physically okay for your dog, that the dog likes to do it, has fun with it, uh, there are limitations. And I don't think there are many dogs who find obedience uh, anything they want to do. Uh, I have had one dog who actually did it, and I never understood why, <laughs> but she actually loved it. And people still remember her because she made so much fun out of it. Okay, I lost a lot of points that way, but I couldn't care less. It was fun, and she was good, really good. Mm. But uh, uh, dogs can do things. Yes, they can. But what dogs really like to do, that is to use their senses, to check out things, be curious, and it's so good for them mentally and physically as well. So being curious, checking out, using their senses as much as possible. But also one thing that I'm sure people don't think about, they, they are pack animals. They live in. A, they like to live in a group, and they help each other. Mm -hmm. They work for each other. The adults bring food to the puppies. Uh, there are always a nanny looking after the puppies when the others go hunting. Uh, they they have jobs to do, and they like it, and they do it out of their goodwill. Mm. And they like to do the same for us. It's not like we do with our kids today, that they are never going to help with anything, and then there are no demands on them, nothing at all. Dogs like to have things to do. And my dogs have loved to help me with a few things. Go, go and get something for me, go and tell my daughter to do something, and find things for me, and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. They like to do that. My German Shepherds, they have been so good at doing gardening together with us. I mean, it was not always correct, but who cares? <laughs> if they took up weeds that wasn't weeds at all, who cares? Mm -hmm. They love to do it because they felt they were helping. So, oh no, oh no, oh, I had such a good question now, I forgot. <laughs> Yeah. So, do you think uh, do you think that there are dogs out there, family dogs that are bored? 
No, I don't think so. Well, some might, but you know, boredom uh, is something that uh, uh, we suffer from because we are so used to be entertained all the time. Mm -hmm. We need to look at television or today's mobile telephone and music in the ear 24 seven and stuff like that. Uh, we get bored. Dogs are really good in when there's nothing to do and nothing is happening they relax and my goodness are they good at that yeah <laughs> some more than others of course mm. but it's a big misunderstanding that dogs need to do things all the time most of the dogs i get uh, uh, for clients they get too little sleep mm. So it's more of a problem that they're doing too much than too little. Very often. But at the same time, I really want to be clear um, because I know there's a lot of misunderstandings that you think that dogs should do nothing. <laughs> I mean, really. No. Uh, I, I, I love dogs to do things. And I actually have, uh, uh, I run seminars on workshops in teaching dogs to find things for you or to uh, go to tell others in the family, bring them uh, messages and stuff. They love to do things like that. Yeah. They love it. So why can't we use them for that? True. Okay, so two more questions about your two other books. First one is Barking, the, uh, yeah, what was the whole uh, English? The sound of a language. Yeah. Was that after coming signals or was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. After. More. Yeah. Why it, uh, I started with it when we started the, our publishing company, which should be about, oh God, it's some years ago now, but it was much later. Yeah. And why did you choose that subject, that topic? I don't know. I can't really remember. Uh, I think I had a lot of questions about barking mm -hmm. and there are, and I started to get, yes, I remember because at that time it started to get so common that when a dog was barking, they put on him L colors or so they could punish the barking or uh, citronella colors or stuff like that. It was always uh, something to, to punish him with when he was barking and I found it so horrible because when a dog is barking he's actually saying something mm -hmm. he wants to say something when a dog is barking it's like underlining something he has tried to say in another way he just had to scream instead of talking yeah just like when people like say a married couple who do not listen to each other they end up screaming to each other mm -hmm. and maybe even fight physically and dogs, when they feel they are not heard, they start to scream and that will be barking. I see, a pattern. I see a pattern. I see that whenever you get pissed off with something, you sit down and you write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I do something, yeah. <laughs> and the, the, um, the other one, walking on, on uh, lead, leash, that was after the barking. Uh, no, that was in between. in between. I had already done that, but that is out of um, out of the the. You cannot get it anymore. You shouldn't get it anymore. It's uh, it's a bit outdated. I need to write another book, and it will be different because you know you learn as you go along, and if you don't learn anything new you shouldn't work with dogs so uh, i i was i thought it was very good when i wrote that book about 20 years ago but i see today uh, no it's not what i would tell people today i would do it differently it has a lot of good points and there's nothing directly wrong in it but i wouldn't do it like that no. that you found better ways to do it better ways absolutely so I need to write another book about how I would do it today. 
be careful and, not saying anything. I will remind you that you said this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I can't understand people who say that, oh, I've done this for 30 years, it works so well. No, it cannot because you always have to change. Yeah. You always learn a little bit more. You learn better ways. And the other thing uh, people don't really know about, I have been doing what I call um, development of uh, training. All, all the years I've been training, mm -hmm. I always had some projects going, trying to find nicer, better, easier ways to do things. And that's why I actually have found a lot easier, yeah. nicer, more efficient ways. I discovered and started to use uh, parallel walking, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, I've changed that a little bit too, but brilliant. But parallel walking as such is really good. All the ones who have used it properly, they can underline that. Uh, the curving. Mm -hmm. Passing other dogs in curving. Or hand signal, you wrote about in, in talking terms. Yes, yeah. Hand signal, uh, I mean, those and a lot of other things I have been developing. And I, I, I'm so surprised that all the hundreds of thousands of dog trainers that have popped up like mushrooms all over the world today, when I started, there were hardly any trainers at all. And today there are dozens and hundreds in every country. Why are they not interested in developing anything and doing things better? Mm. I find it so strange. If you, if you observe how things go, if you see the result of things, I always followed it up and tried to see what happened afterwards when they had been to me. And if I saw that it wasn't good enough, I had to change things. You have to learn from it and learn to do it better. Because yeah, the, one of the biggest assets is obviously to be curious and to, yes. to find solutions. And not be afraid of trying. Yeah. And my goodness, I've tried a lot of things that did not work. Mm -hmm. But I just tried it a little, and if I saw it didn't work, okay, cut it out, do it differently. But how can we, uh, as I can understand, if uh, like new, if you get your first dog today, or if you get your fifth dog today, mm -hmm. there are just like you said, hundreds of thousands of us dog trainers out there. How can you pick the right one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I know what you say. Uh, in the first place, you probably don't need a dog trainer. And you would probably be better without one. Uh, what I tell people, that I, I get a lot of mails of people, who, which class should I go to, which dog trainer should I go to? And I try to tell them that you don't need to do that. I give them a few simple recipes. If you get a puppy, just let the puppy be a puppy. Uh, treat the puppy like you would a, a little child. And teach them some good manners, okay? A little by little, take it easy. Then find a dog or two that the puppy can be together with. And just observe what the adult nice dogs do. Mm. Because they do it right and they learn from the adult dogs you know the dog i i've had in my house that i never had to teach anything at all was a puppy i got when i had three adult dogs in the house i could just let them do the whole yeah. job and she became perfect never had one single moment of trouble with that dog in all her life she was perfectly brought up. It was wonderful to look at. So find good dog friends that can help you. Yes. And when they get old enough to take walks, walk together with another dog or two. Not 20. 
That has nothing to do with learning anything. That's flooding. That's just making stress and nonsense out of things. Take care. Maybe you can, uh, when they get uh, older, take uh, go together with four, five, six other dogs. Yeah, sure. But you start with one or two. So they have a chance of getting to know each other, to learning about each other. I mean, if you go out together with 20 other people, do you, do you learn anything about those people? You don't. No, it's too many. You have to sit down and talk yeah. to people, get to know them. And that's what people misunderstand. It's so popular today to go out and uh, walk together with 25 other dogs up and down and up and down the main street in the city. My goodness, it's so stupid. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, to finish off, you have been really traveling the world. I yes, love yeah. about your traveling, and you did uh, hot, uh, not hotels, um, dog trainer schools in many countries. When I got to know you uh, a few, meant quite many, <laughs> a few years ago now, you were traveling at least twice or three times a month. I think even yeah, three times and sometimes four it was a lot of traveling yeah. but now you settle down in the west of norway and you bought yeah. yourself a little football field with a clubhouse yes i mean every 80 year old people should buy themselves a football field <laughs> you can do so many funny things with it <laughs> And it's called uh, in Norwegian Hunne Lam, dog country, dog land. Mm. Uh, I will also post the details uh, mm. uh, out on the web. So, what are you doing there? Can people contact you and come and meet? Oh, yes, people can. Some do. It's not a rush, I must admit, because people are very scared. It's really scary. But uh, they can, uh, we, we take in anybody who wants to contact us and we talk to them about anything they want to talk about and we can have uh, private lessons if they want to. We are uh, lending them harnesses and leashes long enough. We teach them small things, whatever. We are open for most things. So if you ever plan after COVID, if you ever plan your next travel abroad, you should go to, which is the beautiful part of Norway as well, of course. I mean, there are many, many parts, but it is still Norway. Yeah. It's the most beautiful part of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, is there anything we've been chatting for an hour now? You know, I, we can talk for several hours, but is this something that we forgot? Probably a lot, isn't it? Yes, I, I think there is, because when you have been working so much and so intensely with something that's on your mind for a lifetime and more, there are many, many things to discuss and talk about. And you know that because we have discussed a lot privately in between. And it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. How many things there they are around it yeah i uh, i wish i could do um, more work with dogs physically i'm not able to anymore so uh, i wish because i would love to do more development of things i would love to do more tracking i love tracking and i've been really good in those fields in my time also but uh, I have to do what I can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I would, would like to tell people everywhere. You don't need to do this and do that, what people think you should do. You do what you can, what you feel is good. It's good for your dog and yourself. It's nothing that is written in any book that you have to do this, you have to do that. There's nothing about that. Uh, if you feel that your dog needs to be uh, relaxing at home and have a good time with you, do it then. Mm. That's fine. 
there's nothing wrong in it at all. And if you feel that uh, feeding your dog with these horrible kibbles, dry food, that is uh, not tasting anything and uh, just upset the stomachs of dogs, they get so they got so sensitive stomachs that they cannot even eat one little piece of anything else without getting sick. If you feel you should share food with your dog, do it then. The, the most horrible thing I tell people is uh, I share my food with my dog at the table. I give him from the table. Not a big deal. I would do that with uh, you as well. If you came visiting Lisbon, I would share food with you at the table. And if your dogs were there, I would share with them as well. But I never had dogs that begged at the table. And why is that? Because when they were not going to have any more, I just gave them the hand signal and they respected it and went somewhere else. So it's not a big deal. Could be natural with your dogs. Who says that the dog has to sit before you walk out the door? Do you have to sit before you walk out the door? I would really be angry if I had to do that every time. Or do you have to take a, a somersault or something? Because that's what everybody does before they walk yeah. out. But do you Come think, on. in that sense, Turid, has our relations to animals or to our dogs changed the last 18 yes. years? Yes. In what way? Are we more, now it's kind of leading questions. Is it more distant? There are so little understanding for what animals really are. Mm. And I want to tell one little story because many years ago, 50 years ago, when I was out walking with my young collie, I had just got her, she was one or one and a half year old. We walked around a little and then we met an old lady in the street. And uh, she smiled at us and stopped and we started to talk a little. And then she said, can I pet your dog? Because we used to have a dog like that when I was a girl at the farm I grew up on. And then she turned to me and said, and you know, don't you? that you must never stare an animal in the eye. And you know, I had never forgotten the words and the way she said it. She knew. Mm -hmm. On the farms in the old days, they, they lived so close to animals that they knew that the animals reacted negatively to being stared at. Yeah. It was a threat. And you know, we have forgotten it. So you know, we've forgotten it, basically yeah. We forgot. Yeah. People don't, they don't handle animals with a natural respect anymore. They have to read the book first mm. or see it on internet, what they are going to do. Mm. And isn't that scary? And that's why I, I started by telling about observation. I think that's the only, the, the, the only salvation for the way people are treating animals these days the only salvation we have is to start sitting down and observe them and, and understand what they really are yeah instead of doing 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 because that's what they tell me at the course mm -hmm. and you said to me as well many times follow your gut feeling yeah and if somebody tells you to just tell him now who's the boss, listen to what you feel inside. Is that what I want? I wouldn't do that to my, to my dog. Most so listen, yeah. listen to yourself. Yeah, I, I hope you have a heart. And if you have a heart, listen to it. So, 
yeah, I love these talks, you know that. <laughs> um, so read your books about the calming signals. Um, I will post everything, uh, like I said, on the internet. We will share this uh, talk that we had with a, as many and, people. Yeah. And I love the barking book because there are so many practical yeah. uh, advice there. Mm -hmm. I will make sure to put all the right like right links and everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll do this again when we have some new ideas. We always do, don't we? We do. And uh, if uh, I might be a little cheeky, <laughs> I want to just remind you that I, I actually, at the end of my career, I got the King's Medal. Yes. I'm so sorry. Of course I should have. I th I need to explain this to everyone. It's um, in Norway we have a system. Uh, what is it called in English? The, the it's called the, the King's Medal of Service in Norwegian. When I translate it directly, I don't know. They probably have some other uh, name for it. May, may I I call it Medal of Merit. Uh, I, yeah. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. For her work with dogs for 50 years in Norway and you are the only person in Norway who ever got that kind of um, uh, what you call it well uh, um, this king's medal for this kind of work yeah the, there's one person who got it for for some uh, sled uh, dog things yeah. but for for training working with dogs mm -hmm. I'm the only one here so the king of Norway trusted it, <laughs> and you should too. This is now, is it three, three, four years ago or something, I think? Or uh, it was in uh, 2018. Yeah. And you because... actually went to the castle. Yes. And you met the queen, was it? Because yes. It was, yeah. 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 And you received the medal. Yes. But it's difficult to get, I asked you before if I could get some pictures with you with the with the medal because it's a physical thing. You want to see it now? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can show it to you. There it is. There it is. Oh, beautiful. And <laughs> that must feel nice though. I mean, because it feels really, good. Yeah. yeah. It feels good. Like, uh, it was nice. such a surprise that it was uh, almost a shock. But, uh, you know, I, I think in a way I deserve it. I really worked hard for it. Yeah, to be definitely. Close. 15 mm -hmm. years plus, well, uh, your whole life really dedicated to animals. And still mm -hmm. going on. Like I said. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I remember <laughs> you actually called me to it and you said, can a person who is turning 80 buy a football uh, field? <laughs> and I said, you can do anything. <laughs> I'm sure. I yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. I need projects. Uh, as long as I have a project going, I'm okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably will just go into deep depression. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find projects for you to do. That's good. Okay. Thank and you very much. Suited. Thank you for talking with me. And we'll talk so, again soon. And have a nice time until then. Bye. Bye.